Well, hello, everyone. Good to be with you again for our adult Sunday school lesson. And let me begin first with an apology for my absence. I have been uh, rather busy uh, the last few weekends with various different retreats across the state, both men's and the Sin Law Women's Retreat. And so by the time that wrapped up, uh, it was quite late. And uh, when I woke up on Sunday morning, just needed that extra little bit of sleep that I wasn't getting um, from those two uh, retreats. And so again, I do apologize for my absence. I will try to accommodate and make better preparation for that in the future. Um, so uh, if you will graciously forgive me, I would greatly appreciate that. Um, so today we are looking toward this lesson that is about to round out our unit, <clears throat> but it will be the last in the book of Acts that we will cover in this unit, which is really just going to give us one Sunday off, as you see next week, looking into 1 Corinthians 1 and 12, before we get to the last three lessons of this unit, which will bring us back to the book of Acts. So as you saw on the title screen there, imprisoned for the gospel, as we look now to Acts chapter 12, if you're familiar with this particular moment in the book of Acts, and we are almost at the end of Peter's story arc. So just to kind of preview what's going to come up in the next couple of weeks when we get past next week's lesson and then move into the final unit of this quarter, we're actually going to be backtracking a little bit and going to Acts chapter 9 again. Now what we'll be looking at is the sermon uh, that was preached a few weeks ago with respect to Saul's conversion. I think the reason why the Gospel Project writers set up uh, our schematic like this is because uh, they wanted us to trace the arc of Peter throughout the entirety of Acts and maybe see that as a bit more cohesive rather than the bouncing back and forth starting in chapter 8 between Saul and Peter and uh, watching as their stories begin to diverge before they eventually meet up again. So when we are finished here with Peter, we'll start back with Saul in Acts chapter 9 and continue to progress forward with his story as one solid unit <clears throat> until we round out the book of Acts. So rather than saying imprisoned for the gospel, I have repackaged this with the title, Death and Resurrection Bring the Kingdom. So we're going to read our um, scriptures together, and then after that, we will come back after some time in prayer, and we'll begin to look at what's going on on the screen here and try to make some sense of this. So if you'll join me in Acts chapter 12. Now, we're only supposed to read through verse 19, but I'm going to go ahead and read through verse 23. So about that time, King Herod violently attacked some who belonged to the church, and he executed James, John's brother, with the sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter too during the festival of unleavened bread. After the arrest, he, he put him in prison and assigned four squads of four soldiers each to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was praying fervently to God for him. When Herod was about to bring him out for trial, that very night, Peter stood, Peter bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while the sentries in front of the door guarded the prison. Quickly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and light shone in the cell. Striking Peter on the side, he woke him up and said, Quick, get up! And the chains fell off his wrists. Get dressed, the angel told him, and put on your sandals. And he did. Wrap your cloak around you, he told him, and follow me. So he went out and followed, and he did not know what the angel did was really happening, because he thought he was seeing a vision. And after they passed the first and second guards, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them by itself. They went outside, passed one street, and suddenly the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's grasp and from all that the Jewish people expected. As soon as he realized this, sorry. he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. That is, of course, the Mark who wrote the gospel bearing his name, where many had assembled and were praying. He knocked at the door of the outer gate, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer. She recognized Peter's voice, and because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the outer gate. You're out of your mind, they told her, but she kept insisting that it was true, and they said it is his angel. Peter, however, kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. 
Motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell these things to James and the brothers, he said. And of course, that's James, the half-brother of Jesus, who at this point has taken on the role of leader of the church in Jerusalem. <clears throat> He said this, and he left and went to another place. Now verse 18. At daylight there was a great commotion among the soldiers as, they, as to what became of Peter. After Herod had searched and did not find him, he interrogated the guards and ordered their execution. Then Herod went out from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Herod had been angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Together they presented themselves before him. After winning over Blastus, who was in charge of the king's bedroom, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food from the king's country. On an appointed day, dressed in royal robes and seated on the throne, Herod delivered a speech to them. The assembled people began to shout, It's the voice of a god and not a man. At once an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give the glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. If you'll join me now in prayer. Jesus, our King, Lord, we are so, so very grateful. Lord, as I have been absent for these many weeks, I have not had the chance to express that in this particular place where I, I share an opportunity to speak uh, from your word with my brothers and sisters. And I'm grateful for them uh, being so gracious and tuning back in. Lord, I just pray, thanking you again for the time uh, that we have today and thanking you for the fact that you have shepherded us over the course of another week, that you have helped us navigate the waters of both triumphant moments, but at the same time, others that were challenging, whether to us personally, as goes our faith, whether to our families, as goes um, perhaps the health of family members or various other things, Lord, you know. And I just thank you, Lord, that you continue to prove how faithful you are as you continue to renew your mercies for us each and every day. Lord, as we draw into this time of reflecting upon your word, Lord, we pray that you'll help us to understand you even better by appreciating what it is that you have to teach us through your word. I pray that you would move me, the man, out of the way so that you, by your spirit, will speak. And I pray that you would transform our hearts through what it is that we hear in your word. May I not leave this time or this opportunity to be able to share something to encourage my brothers and sisters and to make them think, as I myself must be challenged, as goes my understanding of what it means to be obedient as a disciple and following you. Lord, I ask these things in your name and for the sake of your glory. Amen. Okay. So, I know this screen is a little busy here. What I would like to do first is actually trace these purple boxes before we start talking about these various individual columns. As goes Jesus and Peter, but these purple blocks really deal more with this third and final column here of prior Exodus arcs. And you know, this is one of my most favorite things to talk about in Scripture, but that is because as a theme in Scripture, it seems to unite the whole. It is indeed one of many themes of Scripture. It's not the only one, certainly, but it is definitely one that helps us cohesively understand the Bible better, especially in places where it's not so obviously being drawn out into the open. And this, of course, seems to be one of those chapters. There's nothing in the context of what we read, as goes a single word or a phrase that points to the Exodus directly. But if we're appreciating the whole context of everything that's going on in the book of Acts, and of course, the Bible itself, I think it's a much easier theme to be able to see. Just popping off the page, once you see it, or once you know, you know, right? Now, I know this is a difficult thing for us to do when we're reading Scripture, especially when we read it in the rather choppy way that we train ourselves to. By that, I mean when we follow a Bible reading plan, which, of course, is a little bit more convenient for us. And so that's admirable. But uh, when we read it by virtue of the division of the book that's inherent to its own structure, as goes various chapters, it's harder for us to keep the whole entire context into play or in place, without forgetting some of those details, especially the further we immerse into that story. But, of course, if we're reading Acts chapter 12, and we've been consistent reading it now for 12 days, then we're all apt to forget what has probably transpired in chapters 1 and 2, maybe not so much the chapters that are uh, in our recent memory from what we've uncovered. However, 
Small details are still apt to escape our attention if we're not carefully plotting out these details and trying to follow that trajectory. So that's what I'm trying to get us to do is to go back and notice some things um, that have transpired just in the previous chapter and help us better understand some of the how that connects to some of the things that have already been mentioned in previous books. So, of course, this would be much more distant in our reading if we've been reading the New Testament start to finish, beginning with Matthew. So that will hopefully make more sense as we track our way through these particular boxes. Just going to take a second here to move my camera out of the way so we can see these purple boxes. All right, so the first purple box under Peter's column. So we go back to Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through 28, and we see that Agabus had predicted a worldwide famine. If we just simply go all the way back <clears throat> to Acts 11, we'll read those verses together. In those days, some prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine throughout the Roman world, and this took place during the reign of Claudius. So each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brothers and sisters who lived in Judea. They did this, sending it to the elders by means of Barnabas and Saul. Okay, so, forgive me. That'll probably happen every time I transition back over to Scripture. Just bear with me on that. So as Agabus predicted a worldwide famine, we see under the column of prior Exodus arcs, this is very similar to an old story that's embedded deep within the Torah. In fact, it comes to us from the very first book of Scripture, when Joseph stood before Pharaoh and predicted a worldwide famine. Now, you might think on the surface, look, I understand these stories could be related in the sense that Joseph predicted a famine, and now this character, who's also a prophet, like Joseph, was being utilized in this moment before Pharaoh, predicts a famine. But just because those, those two story details exist does not mean that those two stories are linked together, because the famine in Joseph's day was a famine that, of course, God was going to use in order to consolidate Israel in Egypt, flourish them there, to eventually bring them out of Egypt to come forth as a nation and then invade Canaan and conquer. How exactly does that relate to what's going on here? Because instead we get a different story. We have a famine that strikes Judea quite severely, but not Egypt. And with that, the Israelites are already consolidated in these. <clears throat> um, what am I trying to say? Uh word is right there on my tongue and I just can't get it. I want to say precincts, but that's not the word. Um, but it does start with a P. I'm sorry. It'll come to me at just the most random moment. Um, these areas ruled over by different powers, whether it's an actual local king or whether it's a Roman prefect or something to that extent. Um, these different regions that are being ruled over by different powers, yet nonetheless, all consist of the ancient territory that was once Israel's by right. So when I say Israel, of course, that's what I mean. Places like Judea, 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 Judea Samaria, uh, Perea, and so forth, that once all fell under the rule of Israel's judges and kings. So <clears throat> they are all consolidated there with the exception, of course, of their brothers and sisters who still remain in the dispersed areas from the previous centuries where various deportations under Assyrian and Babylonian kings had spread them out all over. And of course, they haven't taken the opportunity to migrate back to their homeland yet, choosing instead to remain where they are. And so because in Joseph's day, we have a massive nation that's going to come out and invade the land of Canaan, the land that God had uh, promised to them as their inheritance. There's nothing like that in this story. But to that, I would give you a challenge. I would say if we are paying attention to the actual concept of what this new and final exodus was going to be under Messiah, with him crowned as king, and how that would impact the world, we should be paying attention for details like that. And if we are, which is what we've been primed to do through our lessons together and several, not just previous weeks that sadly we've missed, but months, years that we've been going through this, even when we were covering the original exodus story way back in our time in Torah. 
So if we're paying attention and expecting those details to start to pop up for us, it shouldn't be a surprise that we find something like this. And there are several other details in just the ending of chapter 11 and all of chapter 12 that point us to the fact that these stories are linked. So the next purple box I would point us to is the fact that at the end of chapter 11, we have Barnabas, whose name is really a nickname, uh, as son of consolation, his real name happens to be Joseph. So granted, there's another point that links these stories together, per se, but that in itself is not that important. The fact that he is partnered with Saul, who I'm just going to at this point call Paul, as we're more familiar with, descend into Jerusalem. But as you see here in the parentheses, I have Jer Jerusalem being nicknamed Egypt. But this is not unique to this particular passage. This is something that starts the actual New Testament out for us with respect to Matthew and his gospel. There are so many other points to use to bolster this, but I'm just going to give a few. One of those, of course, being the fact that as Matthew gives us the birth narrative of Jesus, what we have is Jesus trying to escape, uh, of course, the infant Christ under the care of his mother and stepfather, uh, trying to escape the tyranny of Herod the Great, who is trying to snuff out the Christ child by virtue of the fact that wise men have come from far away to seek out this child who was supposedly going to be born in Bethlehem. I'm sorry, in, in Jerusalem, per their understanding, because that's the city they came to first to find the king. And then, of course, when they tell Herod that's why they're there, Herod wants to kill the child by having him executed in Bethlehem once he finds out from the scribes where the Messiah is supposed to be born. And so with that, we're already tracking a couple of things. First of all, that Jesus is sim uh, somewhat a new Moses because of the fact he is being chased down by Herod. And by virtue of the fact that Herod is trying to chase down Jesus and put him to death in his infancy, <clears throat> or at the time when the wise men came, and that could have been much closer to his toddlerhood, something very similar happened, of course, under Pharaoh, who was trying to kill all the boys in Egypt under a certain age for the sake of wiping out a generation so that they would not be able to stand up and withstand him uh, if they chose to side with their enemies someday and overthrow Egypt and the pharaohs. But of course, the teaching of the scribes and elders would say that Pharaoh was aware of a prophecy that a deliverer was going to rise from the actual Hebrews and lead them from the grasp of his tyrannical oppression over them, and that was the reason why he sought after these boys was to kill them. So long before Jesus was ever born, Moses was already being portrayed as something of a messianic deliverer to Israel in Egypt to save them from Pharaoh's hand. I digress. So with that being the case, just in the beginning of the story itself, with Herod being painted as a new Pharaoh who is ruling over a new Egypt, who is all too willing to snuff out the Christ <clears throat> upon his birth. Granted, many people were already looking expectantly for Jesus to be born, or I should say Messiah, as his name was not yet known to them. And you certainly have characters like Simeon and Anna who are there living in Jerusalem and are preaching to people the fact that Messiah is going to be coming soon. Yet still, there are all too many who are willing to do whatever Herod had uh, ordered them to do for the sake of wielding the power that he gave them and enjoying the wealth and status and privilege that came along with that. Many who sympathized with Rome and really didn't care for a Messiah to come and just upset that balance. That being said, Jerusalem itself, instead of being the city where the king would have been the safest, it was the very city where all of David's sons ruled and, uh, of course, were born in that palace. And with the exception of, uh, what's her name, Athaliah, the only queen who ever actually ruled from Jerusalem in the seven years that she did so. And of course, that came at the expense of the previous king's sons all being killed, with the exception of one, Joash, who would come to reign after Athaliah was put to death. All the rest of the sons were born in that palace and experienced safety and no one to really rival their claim to the throne. However, Herod here is indeed a rival claimant to the Messianic throne and line, and he wants to make that known by virtue of his desire to snuff out the Messiah. So all that to just simply say, Herod is the Pharaoh of the story, and of course the city he rules over is the Egypt. I think it's important to establish that because that hasn't changed at all. In fact, if anything, that's only gotten worse 
because as much as the Egypt of Joseph's day eventually became hostile toward his people, welcoming them in with great blessing. And in, in a very real way, that's what we've seen in the book of Acts up to this point, is a massive amount of blessing for this people of <clears throat> the disciples who are the followers of Jesus, who have been preaching, who have been performing miracles, and have garnered lots of favor from the people and now are, are respected and spoken of highly by them. Yet the actual city itself, as goes everyone outside of that group of admirers, and of course, those are the people who are in line, or I should say aligned with, the power brokers, the religious and political leaders of the city itself, and of the Jewish people who want nothing more than to extinguish this movement, starting with cutting off the head in executing Jesus, who they still believe is indeed dead, and his body had been stolen away by his disciples, refused to believe the evidence of the resurrection, and are going to stop at nothing, as far as they're concerned, to snuff out his followers. And they've tried their very best, and of course that's even led to the martyrdom now of one of his own chosen twelve, that being James. So the city of Jerusalem has become even more rank, festering as it has to this place where it's definitely in Egypt, hostile to God's people which at this particular moment are nothing more than Jews who follow Jesus. Of course, we do have the story of Cornelius that's happened here, but those people have not descended into Jerusalem. As goes Jerusalem itself, we have no record of any Gentile believers here, only Jews. So both Joseph and Paul descend into Egypt to bring aid to Yahweh's people, which, of course, is piggybacking on this story over here, the reason why Joseph was even led into Egypt, sold as a slave, so that he could stand before Pharaoh and tell him what the prescription would be for the seven years of famine that was going to follow on after the seven years of plenty. Okay, and then after this, we see that while Herod, uh, or Pharaoh as we'll call him, is there, he kills James and he imprisons Peter. So again, this is exactly what the Pharaoh of Moses' day was attempting to try to do to him, both at his birth and then later on after Moses had actually killed the Egyptian taskmaster, beating one of his fellow brothers. <clears throat> and with that, it imposed the exile upon Moses as he was trying to escape that Pharaoh. And shortly we'll see how that parallels here as well. So we need to understand in this red block that Jerusalem has indeed become a new Sodom in Egypt with Herod, a new Pharaoh. And the reason why I add a new Sodom here is because when we actually get to John's work in Revelation, he calls Jerusalem both of these words, Sodom and Egypt. So I'm baking here a veiled reference to the Revelation. And John makes it clear this is the city he's talking about when he says that is where their Lord was crucified. Of course, this is Jerusalem. There's no other city that is hosted as a candidate. So... Next block in blue, Israel is poised to serve the nations and bring them in to the kingdom. Now, this is kind of skipping ahead in the story of the Exodus in the Old Testament, where, of course, after Moses is successful at the <clears throat> uh, working with the working of the Lord uh, within him and upon him to lead Israel out of captivity at the end of those 10 plagues. And they have led uh, or been led by the angel of the Lord and the pillar of cloud and fire to the sea shore and of course he opens up the sea to bring them through and over to dry or on dry ground over to territory excuse me of the eastern side of the sea <clears throat> we have israel poised to go and conquer canaan for the sake of beginning their mission of reaching the world which is exactly what they are mandated to do under the abrahamic covenant starting in uh, Genesis chapter 12. So if we've paid attention to the story arc of the Exodus given to us in the New Testament, starting with Matthew, we understand by the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus has already walked through the entire arc as Moses, has died as Moses, and then has now been resurrected as a new Joshua, ready to start the new conquest period, which is the reason for Matthew's choice selection of the words that Jesus gives his disciples before he leaves them when he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Now you go conquer the nations, how? By making disciples, baptizing, teaching them, right? That is conquering not just Canaan again for the sake of it becoming the inheritance Israel will possess, but all the world, because all the world is now Israel's to possess. 
not just Israel as the genetic descendants of Abraham. I think it's important to remember the fact that we have experienced a massive paradigm shift here. Israel now is Israel called so under the new covenant, which of course can include ethnic descendants of Abraham. But their circumcision of the flesh matters not anymore. Rather, it's the circumcision of the heart, which Gentiles too, as we saw uh, in the story of Cornelius, can also experience and be called Israel. So now Israel is poised to serve the nations and to bring them into the kingdom, which of course is what the original Israel was supposed to do. Now we'll see how the rest of this story tracks out. The reason why I read it all the way up to verse 23 Soldiers and Herod die, mimicking the death of Pharaoh and the armies. That's exactly what we saw at the very end of that chapter, is it not? Some of those soldiers who were responsible for guarding Peter and yet failed in their efforts to do so because they were asleep and apparently they were allowed to sleep. It's not so bad that they were because all of them were doing so rather than having a rotating guard. And besides, Peter was behind bars and he was locked in chains. This was a supernatural release, right? Which is exactly what Israel leaving Egypt was. But in the frustration behind it all, Herod had to hold someone accountable. And so he executed those guards, just like the armies of Pharaoh were drowned in the sea. And just as Pharaoh was perhaps drowned in the sea, so this Herod, standing now before the people of Tyre and Sidon, being lauded as a god, and doesn't uh, refute that honor, instead giving it to God, God makes an example of him and uses an angel of the Lord to put him to death. But then after that, because the story doesn't end there, Joseph or Barnabas and Saul kind of represent the church, and they make an exodus out of Jerusalem or Egypt back to Antioch to begin the mission to conquer Canaan, or in this case, the Gentile world. That's exactly where the story is leading here. So when I say Joseph or Barnabas and Paul represent the church, I'm talking typologically because Jerusalem, the, the Egypt of this story, is poised to fall. But of course, it hasn't fallen yet. And in a sense, as Barnabas and Saul are the new Moses in this figure, or, uh, or I'm sorry, <laughs> the new Moses in this story and are launching out of Egypt as Moses would have led Israel out of Egypt in the past, we don't see them leading a massive migration of followers of Jesus away from this uh, Egypt and Jerusalem, per se, and then going off to Antioch. They leave their brothers there to continue their work up until the time when Rome lays siege to the city. And then they recall the words of Jesus in Luke 12, I'm sorry, 21, where he told them, when you see armies surrounding Jerusalem, flee, flee to the mountains. And of course, the history preserved for us by Josephus is that they do. So it tracks in a typological way, but not in a completely hyper literal way, as if we are supposed to appreciate or experience um, an actual exodus going on here. Rather, as a typological prefiguring of the church, we understand that eventually, once Jerusalem falls, this is the freedom the church will uh, garner by virtue of no longer being persecuted by either Jerusalem or Rome. Now, granted, there are caveats to that, of course, uh, because even after Nero commits suicide, there will come periodic persecutorial times, uh, even before the end of the first century under Diocletian. So they will enjoy a few decades worth of peace before persecution ramps up again, and some other emperors will attempt to do the same. Yet, while that is the case, <clears throat> uh, for the most part, in those first three centuries, they experience far much, uh, far much more peace than they actually do persecution. I digress again. So they make an exodus out of Jerusalem or Egypt, and they go back to Antioch, where they were commissioned to go and offer this gift up, and then, of course, to come back. Now, when they do that, when they wind up coming back to Antioch, now what we have here is a hybridized movement going on where we have both Jews working alongside Gentiles. And by virtue of that, are continuing the process of sharing the gospel with all those around them, pulling more into the church, perhaps day by day, until eventually Paul and Barnabas are both commissioned to start that conquest by going westward into the provinces of Achaia and beyond, on into Macedonia, and then start proselytizing from amongst the Jews and Gentiles there. So I lay out that backdrop 
because I think the history behind it and the parallelism is extremely important for us. And the reason why is because here we'll better understand why Peter is being arrested in the first place. It's because, of course, we have Jerusalem acting like a new Egypt and the tyranny of this Herod, the grandson of the Herod who attempted to try to kill Jesus, is in full swing here. And he's doing this because he wants his Jewish, Jewish subjects to remain loyal to him. And, of course, by doing this, even though they don't really like the Herods that much, they favor this Herod more than they did Herod the Great. But still, he's not their king, as goes the Messianic descendant from David, and they recognize that. But he does what he must in order to continue to <clears throat> steward this very uneasy relationship he has between them, that he has between himself and Rome, and trying to keep them and Rome in agreement with each other and peace preserved. So doing something that would cause him to be a little bit more favorable in the polls would certainly be something that would be helpful rather than harmful. So that's the reason why Peter and James are both arrested. And of course, the reason why Herod gets involved and starts putting these men to death. And it seems that things have changed here, right? Because it was in the time of Jesus. Herod, while he had the authority to judge Jesus, it's not particularly clear whether or not he would have had the authority to put him to death per se. Perhaps he would because as a tetrarch, he was uh, entrusted with the guardianship and rulership uh, or I should say rule over Galilee and because Jesus was considered a Galilean subject that didn't necessarily put him under the jurisdiction of Pilate for him to deliver the death sentence though he certainly could by virtue of the power entrusted to him by Rome but here if things were not quite that ca the case with Herod uh, Antipas at the time of Jesus's trial certainly this Herod has been given that authority from Rome. And things have indeed changed because the Tetrarchy itself doesn't exist as it did in the time of Jesus' crucifixion where we have a Roman governor who is ruling and presiding over and in Jerusalem. That doesn't exist anymore. I digress. So let's get to Jesus and Peter and start to fill in all these green bubbles here to make sure we understand how their stories are being mapped onto each other. So we see that, of course, Jesus was in prison during the very days of unleavened bread, because that's the feast that comes right on the very heels of Passover. As soon as Passover commences, we jump right into seven days worth of eating unleavened bread. And this is, of course, the very time when Peter himself is imprisoned. We saw that in the text that we read. Now, one thing that is dramatically different, almost a 180 degree divergence between these two stories, is that after Jesus was arrested, he was virtually abandoned by everyone during his trial. I mean, granted, some of his disciples are following close by. We know that to be the case because Jesus speaks from his cross to John to entrust his mother's guardianship to John after his death. And of course, after his resurrection, because he knew he was going to be going back to his father and his mother had several years yet to live. So with that in mind, <clears throat> we know that even though John was close by, yet still, John had followed at a distance to keep himself safe and was probably keeping himself, himself somewhat disguised. And Peter had already denied Jesus three times. Judas was dead, and all the other disciples had fled uh, from the garden after the uh, Roman guards, or I should say temple guards, had come to lay siege to Jesus. So with all that in mind, when we look back over to Peter's story, we might expect a very similar parallel, but that's not the case at all. Granted, Peter is surrounded by a whole entire cohort of guards, and no one would have access to him to come and visit him whatsoever. And because he is currently held in chains, it's not to anyone's fault that he is, uh, in a sense, uh, alone and isolated, but certainly not abandoned. Because the one thing they can do for him is pray for him. And we have a group of people who were gathered at John Mark's mother's house to do that very thing. So people are praying. Um, for, for his arrest and hoping for his release, of course. And whereas Jesus is not released, he has to go through every bit of the torment and the scourging in, uh, in, uh, in order to ultimately lead up to the moment of his, his actual death, his subsequent crucifixion. And then he is later released from death, of course, through his resurrection. That does not happen to Peter. Peter is bound under death sentence. And it seems like he's perhaps within 24 hours of being executed. But that doesn't come. And why? Because at this moment... The, uh, the angel comes to rescue him from here. Now, one might ask, why exactly the angel waited so long? And to that, I don't have a response. Maybe part of it is because it actually 
maps over this particular story of Jesus to keep them together, um, as goes these two stories, so that we can appreciate while Jesus surrendered unto death and his resurrection is what, of course, brought the kingdom. Peter, as Luke has been masterfully crafting these stories, is yet another Jesus-like figure in the story. We've already seen this with Stephen and the very close details in Stephen's story, whereas we see Stephen being falsely accused, Stephen preaching before those who have falsely accused him and making proclamations about the coming of Christ and so forth. Uh, now, granted, you know, that was already part of the charges built into it. But nonetheless, Jesus makes the statement to Caiaphas and those who are putting him under oath, you will soon see the Son of Man. Stephen is said to have seen the heavens open and the Son of Man standing. And of course, the very last things that uh, these two men would say, Jesus from his cross and Stephen on his knees as he's being stoned to death, asking that the Lord would not hold the sins of these people to their own charge. So, as Jesus' death and his blood waters the ground where the seed has been sown to allow it to, to begin to blossom and the fruit of the kingdom to be born with he as the first fruits, Stephen, in a sense, is doing something very similar, although his blood in and of itself, while precious in the eyes of God, as a martyr. Now, his blood, of course, does nothing to atone for sin, but it does spark the process that's going to lead to some reconciliation. After all, it was Saul who was standing there giving consent to Stephen's death, and by virtue of what he saw and witnessed there, it launches him on a campaign to try to snuff out this Jesus movement with as much tenacity and uh, violence as it takes in order to get the job done until he himself is converted in the process. So ultimately, Stephen and his death lead to Saul's conversion by virtue of everything that transpired there. So Stephen's death, like Jesus's, was in many ways not just reconciliatory, but also even fruitful for the sake of uh, furthering the kingdom, because after this, many other people will come to believe. And of course, that is exactly how Luke, as he uses this formula yet again, rounds out chapter 12 with respect to many more people believe, and by virtue of that, the church grows as we go to verse 24, but the word of God flourished and multiplied, right? So, hold on just a second. There we go. Continuing on with this series of parallels, an angel came to release Peter and lead him out of prison. So in a sense, even though Peter is under death sentence and he never goes through death, he is resurrected from that death arc that uh, we saw building up in the tension of the story, whereas James was not so fortunate. Back to the story of Jesus on the left side of the screen, Jesus is resurrected from death, as was Peter. The first people to encounter Jesus were women, right? All four Gospels unanimously test, uh, testify to the fact that Jesus was first encountered by women who came to see Jesus in anointing him more for his burial, not expecting that he would be resurrected on the third day, and were thankfully greeted with a wonderful surprise. The same happens to Peter here because as soon as he runs after the angel leaves his presence, he goes right to the house of John Mark's mother, and a little girl by the name of Rhoda happens to be at the gate. So then moving back to the left side of the screen, the women run to tell uh, the disciples of Jesus' resurrection, and Rhoda does the same thing. She leaves Peter standing outside, where he is, of course, vulnerable, uh, but then runs deeper into the house to tell everyone that, indeed, Peter is standing outside. Jesus disappears from the presence of his disciples for an indetermined period of time, because we're not given an exact chronological layout of those final 40 days that Jesus had with his disciples before he ascends and goes unto heaven. But, of course, we have the same thing happening with Peter. Peter left the disciples, and Luke tells us he went to another place. And for all intent and purpose, Peter's story arc here is concluded in the book of Acts, with the brief exception of his appearance at the Jerusalem Council. And at some point, according to Christian history, and tradition, Peter makes his way to Rome, not to establish the church there. It's been established already, and it's been thriving for some time. But he does wind up there shortly before the days oh, sorry, of his own crucifixion. Now, because we read through this, let's go back and backtrack just a bit to get to this one final green block, just to make sure that we see how this ties in also to the prior Exodus arcs. As Joseph was resurrected from his own death in his prison sentence, mapping over now with Peter and Jesus's, we see that 
this is in keeping with the theme of this lesson, and that is if you look back to that first gray block, this is what God has been doing multiple times throughout different stories in Scripture. We'll go to Lot. Lot is locked up in Sodom, was he not? And then an angel of the Lord leads him out. And then Israel being led out of Egypt, indeed by an angel of the Lord in the pillar of uh, fire and cloud. And now, of course, uh, Joseph being resurrected from his death sentence in prison yet again. <clears throat> another story arc uh, where we see these very similar details. So I would actually forgotten to point that out, and it would perhaps float a little better if I had done so. I'll remember that when I go and teach that lesson this morning in my own Sunday school class. But to get to a, uh, a few points here with respect to a Sunday school application of this, because you might think, well, this is all neat information to have, appreciate the connections, but what does this do as goes me and my journey of faith with Jesus? Well, as goes the lesson title itself, Death and Resurrection Bring the Kingdom. So how is your story arc following on with that of Jesus's, Right. It's not that every one of us have to follow the kind of story path that either Stephen or Peter did, that we have to face tyrannical threats, that we have to be martyred even for our stories to uh, mimic Jesus's in um, the only way that matters. Certainly not. But we are told by Jesus repeatedly that our responsibility as disciples is, of course, to deny and die, right? Deny ourselves, die to ourselves, to take up our cross and follow him. That is a transcendent uh, concept that Jesus wants to make sure that all of his disciples clearly understand. And, of course, a, a teaching point from the Gospels that none of us are to quickly ignore. So if we appreciate that fact, then we are right on par with what these disciples were doing as we watch in their stories how they parallel the very life of Jesus because they were willing to put themselves in dangerous situations <clears throat> in order to achieve the very goals that Jesus had set for them. And of course, to reach others the way that Jesus intended for them to be reached through his own disciples. And that includes not just the first disciples, but us as well, who are willing to do whatever it takes and to put ourselves in whatever situation necessary for the sake of seeing these people come to encounter this very Jesus that we're preaching to them. So again, I ask the question to you, how is your life tracking that of Jesus's? How is it mimicking and paralleling the life of Christ, right? Are you teaching others the truth of God's word, which is exactly what Jesus came to do in order to prepare them for the arrival of this kingdom? We are to be doing the very same thing, teaching other people the truth of God's word and the fact that this kingdom has arrived. Its Messiah has been reigning for twenty uh, or for 2,000 years. He is coming back again, and when he does, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess the world will be judged, and when that happens, the wicked will be expunged from existence, and they will be sentenced to their eternal rewards for their own rebellion against God and their insistence upon that rebellion rather than entering into a right relationship with God by means of what Jesus had done, the free gift of God in uh, the death and resurrection of his son that who was offered in their place so that in dying with him through his death, they might also live with him in his life. So if they continue and persist in their rebellion, they will experience eternal separation from God and hell. Are we telling people this? Are we working to try to reconcile them and bring them into the kingdom? Uh, beyond that, are we being obedient to Jesus' commands as these disciples were in breaking bread with others, inviting people into our homes for the sake of bringing them into discipling and accountability relationships? This is exactly what we saw Jesus done, as goes the own pattern of his network of followers, right? He chose people, called them to follow him, to draw them closer, deeper into this truth and this intimate relationship with him. We're not calling people to follow us. We're not drawing them into deep, intimate relationship with us. We are doing this for the sake of them following us as we follow Jesus to then teach them and turn them back around to go back to this broken world and repeat this pattern with those who they will encounter, right? So how are our lives, yours and mine, mimicking Jesus's. Are we willing to die? Now, we might say, as Peter did to Jesus, Lord, I will go with you both to prison and to death, but do we really mean that? And granted, on the one hand, I do speak of physical death. Are we willing to go wherever Jesus may send us across the globe, even if it's here in our own country, where sadly some of these Jews 
were experiencing death. Several of Jesus's apostles will go to different places and be martyred. Um, as supposedly Mark was, and granted he's not an apostle, down in Egypt when he went to share the gospel in Alexandria, or even Thomas, who were killed by the native people of India uh, when he went to share the gospel there, and all of the other stories in between with respect to those original apostles and the first generation of disciples. But I'm also asking, are you willing to die daily to yourself for the sake of Jesus having the very reward of his suffering? He died so that you and I might live, not live to simply wait for our ticket to be punched and go to heaven someday, because heaven is not even going to be our eternal reward. This earth is our eternal reward with God and the Lamb, both sharing his throne of authority in heaven, <clears throat> being the ones who come down here to dwell with us at the end of time, which is exactly what John saw in the apocalypse, right? So we're not waiting to just simply go to heaven. Are we willing to die in order so that he might have the reward of his suffering, suffering, a truly transformed life in which the very things that he wants from us is what we are all too willing and eager to give him, which is total obedience, total obedience, being holy as he is holy, withstanding from being in some way uh, conformative to this world, but rather being transformed through the renewing of our mind as we immerse ourselves deeper into relationship with him, right? And with that, uh, what are we doing to try to bring the kingdom and manifest it into the lives of other people? These are the things we should be asking ourselves, because if we're not doing much in the way of that, then sadly, whatever it is that we think we're doing as disciples is not consistent or even conducive to discipling or discipleship in and of itself. So I pray that we would contemplate that as we move from this time and space. And I ask Jesus that you would please make those ideas even more relevant in our mind as only you can lord we need you to make this clear for us motivate move us to that place lord where we are being perfectly obedient to you by virtue of that you are reaching the nations through us we ask it in your name amen thanks for listening